On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. The Rebbe once said, when a child is born, that is a statement from God that from this moment and on, the world can't be perfect without this human being, without this child. And therefore, everybody has a potential. God doesn't need us. We don't know why he has chosen this path, but we do know that he has. And he wants each and every one of us to be a partner in his big scheme. And he's longingly looking at us with love and saying, please be my partner. Yossi Groner is Senior Rabbi and Spiritual Leader of Congregation Or HaTorah, a Jewish Orthodox congregation. He is the Founder and Director of the Charlotte Chabad House, a Jewish Educational Resource and Outreach Center, which offers weekly lectures on the Bible, Talmud, and Kabbalah. The Chabad House is an affiliate of the International Chabad Lubavitch Movement, with its headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. Rabbi Groner is co-founder of Charlotte Jewish Day School and the Jewish Preschool. He is a visiting rabbi at several correctional institutes, including the Mecklenburg County and Guilford County Jails. Rabbi Groner leads the Charlotte Jewish Learning Institute, which provides professional courses on Jewish law, ethics, and mysticism. In this episode, we explore the Chabad movement, the coming of the Messiah, the inner Torah, and what God wants for us. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Rabbi, thank you for your time today. It's a pleasure. I'd like to begin by understanding the landscape of Judaism. There are Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, what is the difference theologically between these classifications? I believe that you ask most of the Jewish people who are either members of any of these three branches that you mentioned, they will say that theologically we all believe the same thing, one God, and that we all can develop a relationship with God. It's in the practice of the religion and the traditions where we differ. And that actually started more in recent history than in the ancient history of the Jewish people. And it's more pronounced here in the United States. I personally don't like the labels because I believe that the labels divide. I do believe that the labels are used more to define what the level of one's ritual obligation could be. But as far as feeling Jewish or Jewish values, each one interprets it according to their doctrine. I think everybody feels very Jewish. What makes a person a Jew? It's a birthright, someone that's born Jewish or someone that converted to Judaism. And converting to Judaism is not that simple. It's very similar to the earliest first Jews that their conversion took place at Mount Sinai when we became a Jewish people. But it is a birthright, and in orthodoxy, which I adhere to, it is matrilineal descent that determines the uh, identity of a person as a Jew. Rabbi, what is Hasidic Judaism? Hasidic Judaism is something that came about in the 18th century. It was a response to the challenges that the Jewish people were facing at that time, primarily by the Industrial Revolution, also a result of the Chmielnitzki bands in Poland massacred many Jews and demolished many Jewish communities. And the Hasidic community came in as a revival group to revive the passion in Judaism, to be an optimistic group, to give people a reason why to continue on. 
and it was founded by Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov, who was a mystic, very kind man, and he loved people. And even though he himself was very erudite, he recognized that there was a big divide between the upper class and lower class within the Jewish community itself, and he wanted to bridge that gap and bring people to recognize that everyone has a contribution to make, and everyone is a vital part of the Jewish people. So even the simple people that weren't erudite did not know how to study. He was there to encourage them. And Hasidism, for that reason, spread like wildfire throughout Eastern Europe, and it created, after his passing, many dynasties. Rabbi, there is a movement within Hasidic Judaism called Chabad Lubevich, or just Chabad. What is Chabad? Well, Chabad is the third generation of Hasidim. After the Baal Shem Tov, there was Rabbi Dov Be'er of Mizrich. And Rabbi Dov Be'er of Mizrich had many students, and one of them was Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi, who founded the Chabad movement. Chabad actually is an acronym for three Hebrew words. Chachma, Bina, Dat, translated as wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And the notion of Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi was, he felt that it was insufficient just to serve God with passion and emotions. But there needs to be the bedrock intellectual foundation to be able to perceive and understand the depth of the theology of, of Judaism, which comes through mysticism as well, through Kabbalah. And the Chabad emphasizes the intellectual faculties as a basis for our theology. Intellectualism has long been part of the Jewish faith. What was new about it within the Chabad tradition? You're right. Intellectualism is very important to Judaism, Jewish knowledge, Jewish erudition. And as probably know, there are reams and reams and volumes and volumes of intellectual study on Jewish law. Jewish philosophy, and Jewish tradition. What Chabad brought to the table was not just the intellectual of the how, but the intellectual of the why, to understand the deeper mystical meaning of God, the deeper mystical meaning of life. The idea is that faith in itself is something that hovers above us, it surrounds us. But in order to internalize faith, one has to be able to comprehend it intellectually as well. And actually, the intellectualism allows you to process it, just like you process any idea. Then it resonates with you. And then it has a much greater impact on the person when you're able to understand it. Intellectualism doesn't mean just to question it or to challenge it. Intellectualism means to study it, to try to understand what it is. Rabbi, within Chabad, there is a person called the Rebbe. Who is the Rebbe and what role does the Rebbe play in Chabad? Well, the Rebbe is the leader of the Chabad movement and of the Chabad dynasty, and it's a very important role. It goes back to the time of Moses. Moses was referred to as Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher. And the idea of a teacher wasn't just a teacher or a mentor, but his soul was on a much higher, more spiritual level, a much more godly soul than the soul of the rest of the community. And therefore, it It allowed him to be more sensitive to the divine and also more sensitive to the people. Moses was also the most humble of all people, even though there was no one in his time or in history that had the face-to-face interaction with God. But the humility was that he recognized that it wasn't about him, it was about the people. And that is the role that a Rebbe assumes when he takes over the leadership. And in the dynasties of Hasidism, It's usually handed down from the founder of the Chabad dynasty to their child, if the child is worthy, which that's a general Jewish concept, which is taken from the Bible, that if the son is worthy, so then the son can receive it. If not, it could be the student. And we find many cases like that in early Jewish history. When Aaron, the high priest, passed away, it was transmitted to his son, Elazar, who became the high priest. But when Moses passed away, it was given to his faithful student, Joshua. So a lot of it has to do with who is worthy of being the Rebbe. A Rebbe is born a Rebbe. A Rebbe is not someone that is just groomed. You can see within the soul of the Rebbe that this person stands 
apart from the rest on a very spiritual, meaningful way, unlike anyone else. There have been seven Rebbes within the Chabad tradition? Yes. It started with Rabbi Schneir Zaman of Liadi, and it was then transmitted to his son and then to his son-in-law, who happened to be a grandchild of the founder, and it always remained within the family. The Rebbe of our generation is Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. He was a great, great grandchild of the founder of Chabad and the second and third leaders of Chabad, and he was also a son-in-law of the sixth Rebbe. And after the previous Rebbe passed away in New York in 1950, there wasn't a doubt for a moment by any of the followers or adherents of Chabad that the Rebbe was the one that would take over, but he was reluctant to take the mantle of leadership, and it took a year until he finally accepted it. Rabbi, you've shared a wonderful story about how uh, Rabbi Schneerson reluctantly took the mantle. I'm wondering if you might share that story. There were many Jewish leaders around the, the world, actually, that had sent letters and petitions to the Rebbe asking him to please take the leadership. This was in 1950, starting in February, and the Rebbe was quite reluctant to do that. He also put a denial in the Yiddish newspaper to say that it's not happening. And on the day of the anniversary of the passing of his predecessor, he went to the previous Rebbe's resting place, and he took along with him the petitions. And he stood for hours by the graveside of the uh, previous Rebbe weeping. When he finally came back that evening, there was a huge assembly, and he addressed the assembly. But he didn't address the assembly as if he was Rebbe. At one intermission, one of the elders stood up and said, we want you to be the Rebbe. And he ignored him. And then a little while later, he took out his handkerchief and wrapped it around his hand, and he began to deliver the discourse that Rebbe's traditionally would deliver. And that's when everybody realized that he took the mantle. Rabbi, the Rebbe died in 1994. Is there a Rebbe now in Habat? The Rebbe is the Rebbe today as he was before. And it's a phenomena in Chabad that never existed before. You can say because there was no one worthy of taking his place. You can say also that there was a tremendous love, like children to a father, that they don't want to have another father. This is our father. The connection that exists with the younger generation today and the Rebbe through his teachings even watching videos of his addresses is phenomenal. I'm just amazed because I had interaction with the Rebbe growing up as much as one can have interaction with the Rebbe. But looking at the next generation and the next generation and watching their fascination with the Rebbe's teachings and the Rebbe's ideas and acting on it in their personal lives and also in public, what they do for the community is just a phenomenon. There is a statement in the Talmud about Jacob, the third of the patriarchs, that when the Bible describes his death, it doesn't use the word death. And the Talmud makes a statement and says, Jacob, our father, didn't die. And then they said, but how can you say that? He was buried. They uh, eulogized him. They mourned after him. And the Talmud says, just as his children are alive today, he is alive. In other words, he lives through the children. The Rebbe is alive through his students, through his teachings, which is an eternal message. Does the devotion that exists for the Rebbe create space for a new Rebbe to come along? Or does that devotion preclude someone emerging? I think it's the latter. I don't think it's on the mind of anyone currently to even want to have another Rebbe, I mean. You know, Jews believe in the coming of the Mashiach, which is the Hebrew for the Messiah, and they believe that that will be the future of Chabad as well. But uh, in the interim, there is not a discussion or even a thought about that. What is the Mashiach? Mashiach is the Hebrew for the word anointed. According to the Torah, any person that reached a high position, like being the high priest or the king of Israel, needed to be anointed with a very special oil. 
that was kept in the holy temple. If the king died and it was given over to one of his children and there was no controversy, then there was no need for anointing. If there was controversy or if it wasn't a child, then they needed to be anointed. And the anointment was an, a sign of appointment. We anoint to appoint. The Jewish belief is that there will be a reestablishment of the Davidic dynasty. When that happens, whoever that individual is will need to be anointed. And therefore, he was referred to as the anointed king, Melech HaMashiach. And in short, it's Mashiach. Today, it's known as the Messiah. But the literal translation of Messiah means the anointed one. Mashiach is a cornerstone in Jewish belief, going back to the origin of the Bible, where God says to Israel, you'll be dispersed, but I will call you back. And then Isaiah and Jeremiah, but primarily Isaiah, describe that there will be the time that the Messiah will come and there will be peace in the world. One nation will not swallow another nation. This that it says that the wolf will lie with the lamb, according to Maimonides, is, a, is metaphoric for the peace that will exist amongst nations. So it's important to us. Many people within Chabad, I understand, believed that the Rebbe was a messianic figure. What is your understanding? Well, we believe that in every generation there's someone worthy of being the Messiah. There is no question that there was a movement within Chabad, unofficial, that really promoted the idea. The Rebbe was emphatic that it is not our mission or our job to identify any individual as the Messiah. That's between God and the Messiah. Our job is to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah, to make the world a better place, to ignite more light, to be kinder and gentler, to make the world a livable place without war, and with harmony, and to prepare it in a way that when the Messiah comes, he will be able to continue what he's doing. Who anoints the Messiah? It would have to be the elders of Israel. Who are the elders of Israel? That's a good question. You know, one of the signs that the Messiah has come is that there will be peace and harmony in the world. Included in that, that there will be peace and harmony within the Jewish community. So the very fact that there will be a consensus within the Jewish community at large, that these are the elders, that in itself will tell you that the Messiah is here. A sign that the Messiah is here is that there is consensus among the Jews. We may be waiting a long time. It could happen very soon because, first of all, Maimonides points out that one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith is to believe in the coming of the Messiah imminently, that it can happen today and it will happen today. And if it's a delay, it's only temporary. In our times, actually, it's much easier to comprehend this kind of idea because what used to take generations to put uh, ideas into motion and to create movements today can take moments and you have movements. So it's not that difficult to imagine that. Agreement among Jews. Well, actually, that is the epitome of being Jewish, but it's an unfortunate reality that going back to our culture, having strong opinions and always being opinionated about our ideas, the disputes were never personal. The disputes were more theological, philosophical, and how to practice. That's a result of the dispersion of the Jews for so many years in lands that were not their own. And they developed very strong opinions. So it is true. I'm reminded of a story that sounds humorous on the outside, but it has a bitter truth to it, that when uh, Menachem Begin was invited by President Jimmy Carter to the White House together with Anwar Sadat from Egypt to discuss the possibility of having peace between Israel and Egypt, God was so happy that he appeared to, to them and said, just give me one wish each and I will grant it. And Jimmy Carter said, I would like to see peace between the United States and Russia. And God said, it will happen, but not in your lifetime. Then Anwar Sadat turned to God and said, I'd like to see peace between Egypt and Israel. 
And God said, it'll happen, but not in your lifetime. And then he turned to Menachem Begin, and Menachem Begin said, you know, I'd like to see peace amongst the Jews. And God sighed, and he said, I'm afraid it's not going to happen even in my lifetime. <laughs> what do you take from that, Rabbi? What I take from that is that the truth of the matter is that it's a challenge for us because deep inside, we are one people and we really care for each other. But we're, we're, we're very opinionated and we hold very strong to our opinions. And it goes back to the days of the Talmud when there were disputes and interpretation of some of the legal aspects of the Torah. And you had schools that ruled in one way and schools that ruled in another way. And then it had to be vetted and it, the decision was made. So the idea of expressing your opinion or your objection or your opposition is very much so. And it's part of the Jewish culture. You see that in Israel today as, as well in the Knesset uh, with how many parties they have. And if you watch a session in the Knesset and you see the arguing that goes on there, it's just amazing. But on, at the end of the day, they're all friends. I would say that the disunity is more on the surface. But when there is a threat to the Jewish community, or when there's a call to action, we bond together and we're all there together. Rabbi, the website for the Charlotte Chabad House says that Chabad is considered the most dynamic force in Jewish life today. How so? Because it has kindled the sparks of Jewish life in places that you wouldn't imagine that it exists. I'll give you a little example even from New York City. In 1974, the Rebbe came out with this idea of creating mitzvah mobiles. A mitzvah means to do a ritual or commandment of God from the Torah. We were one of the first that went out to Manhattan, and we went to a section in Broadway that there is no obvious Jewish life there. And we began to stop people in the street asking if they're Jewish and inviting them on a mitzvah mobile, teaching them some Torah and donning tefillin with the men, giving out candlesticks to the ladies to do the Shabbat candles. And there was this uh, deli across the street. It wasn't a kosher deli, but it was owned by a Jewish man. And sometime in the middle of the day, he runs out with a tray full of soft drinks and chips, stuff that was kosher. And he says, in my 45 years on Broadway, I never imagined that there would be the portable synagogue and that you're going to be stopping Jews in the street. That's a concept of a dynamic force. Going to far-flung places like Siberia or the Congo, going to Alaska and going to South America and looking for Jews and inspiring them to reconnect with their people, that's a dynamism that you don't find anywhere else. Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of England, made an interesting statement, and he said, just as Hitler hunted down the Jews for extermination, the Rebbe has been hunting down Jews to reconnect them and to say, don't get lost, you're part of our peoples. Who are emissaries within the Chabad tradition? When the Rebbe took over the leadership, the Rebbe said that things are going to be a bit different under his leadership, and that is that he's going to involve everyone in the work that his father-in-law started when he came to the United States, and that is to plant the seeds of Judaism and the ethics of Judaism and the spirituality and the mysticism of Judaism throughout the world. And the Rebbe's vision was global. And the Rebbe appointed people in the early years to take that position and sent them out to different locations around the United States and around the world. And eventually, he wanted people to draft themselves into it. And those that are recognized to be working officially in the realm of Chabad and have the right to open up a Chabad center, they are called the emissaries of the Rebbe. You are an emissary? Yes, I am. Is there an evangelical element to what you are describing? Absolutely not, because the mission of Chabad is primarily towards fellow Jews and to inspire them to become closer to Judaism. It is definitely not our goal to seek converts to Judaism. When we encounter people who are not of the Jewish faith, the message that we have is that they can be better human beings and connect with God as well, but it doesn't have to be through Judaism. 
Rabbi, I'd like to talk about some core themes of Chabad. I've read that the most fundamental theme underlying all Hasidic theory is the eminence of God in the universe. Can you talk more about eminence? Yes. Actually, it's a cornerstone within the Chabad Hasidic philosophy, and it's called the unity of God with the world. God did not only create the world and left it to its own device or to its own way, but God continuously, it's a continuous force that continues to enliven the world, to sustain the world, and God is very present within the world. Everything we see in the world has a spark of godliness in it, and it could be something as inanimate as a mineral or something as alive as an animal. There is a spark of God in it, how much more so when it comes to human beings. The whole concept of the theology of Judaism is to reveal that oneness that unites everything with God, even though it manifests itself in multiple ways, but that doesn't take away from the oneness. The imminence of God is that anything that you encounter, anything that you touch, has an element, an aspect of God in it. Otherwise, it couldn't exist. The creation of the world is not just a one-time event. It's a continuous event because by nature, the world should not exist. Only God should exist. And in the presence of God, there would be a total non-existence because God is totally infinite. It is only because of God's will that God wants the world to exist, that that sustains the world and that gives life to the world. In Kabbalah, there is much discussion of how that filters through from the infinite into the finite. And that is something that Hasidic, especially Chabad Hasidic theology, deals with at great length. But the ultimate goal is that God is imminent in every aspect. I was just reading a story today of someone who encountered the Rebbe back in the 70s. He asked the Rebbe, where is God? And God said, everywhere. He says, what does it mean everywhere? He says, in a tree, in a stone. But the man wasn't satisfied. The Rebbe said, in your heart. In your heart, that's where God is. Because it's every part of life is where we find God. Is God a being? It's actually addressed by Maimonides, who is known as one of the greatest Jewish minds, both in law and in philosophy. And he starts his um, book of the 14 volumes of Jewish law by saying that the foundation of all foundations the pillar of all wisdom is to know that there is a first being. But his being is not our kind of being. Our being is an optional being. We could have been or we could have not been. It was the choice of someone else that we came into being. God's being is a mandatory existence. So it's a different kind of being. That raises all sorts of ontological questions as to what the nature of being is. But we will move on. Right. Rabbi, what is the inner Torah? Just as the human being is comprised of a body and a soul, the body is the function of the human being, the brain, the heart, um, and all the organs. The soul is the inner aspect of the human being, and they live in harmony. Similarly with the Torah, there is the body of the Torah. Those are all of its laws, all of its history, all of its stories, all of its traditions. And then there's the inner aspect of the Torah, which is the mystical, the divine, the godliness. And if you take any verse of the Torah, you could learn and study the body of it, but ultimately you want to get to the soul. And the soul takes you much, much deeper. It's, it's like going deep sea diving and exploring things that you couldn't see on the surface. That makes up the inner theology of Judaism. I imagine... This has been a long debate between the letter and the spirit of the law within Judaism. It's actually not a debate. The conclusion is that there needs to be harmony between the letter and the spirit of the law. But I would say it's a little different than the spirit of the law. Because in, in the legal realm of Jewish law, you also find a debate of what is the letter of the law and what is the spirit of the law. We're taking it much deeper than the spirit of the law. We're talking about the inner meaning. To give you an example, in the book of Job it says, from my flesh I perceive God. 
What does that mean? The flesh, flesh is materialism. How do you see God? But I'm going to throw the question back to you. When God created Adam, and we believe that Adam and Eve were created as one human at first, it says it'll be created in, in God's image and God's form. And then later when you come to the Ten Commandments, it says you shall have no image of God because God doesn't lend himself to an image. Now, that should pose a question because it's a kind of a contradiction. In one place, it says that God has no image. And in the other place, it says that the human was created in God's image. So what's the meaning of that? Well, the answer is God does not have an image, but the revelation of God has an image. The way the light of God flows from the inner essence of God into the world, it does have an image. And the image is actually one of three columns, a right, a left, and a center. And the human being, the physical human body, is created that way, that we have a right side and a left side and a center. The right is all about giving and flowing. As King Solomon says, with my right arm, I embrace. It's the idea of love and giving. The left side is withdrawal. The center is what fuses the two together. It's the third element that is able to stand beyond the right and left and bring him to, not compromise, but to a, a higher level. And interestingly enough, the head is not on the right or the left, it's right in the center. So the center column is what fuses the right and the left. That is interesting in Kabbalah, the concept of tikkun olam. Tikkun olam is to repair the world. It's brought down in Kabbalah that when God created the world, it was utter chaos at first. And he destroyed the chaos, and then he recreated it with tikkun. What was chaos? Two columns. When you have two columns, you have the right and the left. The right and the left are always battling each other for superiority. But when you have a center column, it brings a sense of balance to the universe. So here you look at the human body, and the human body actually becomes the icon and the image of the divine manifestation with a very important message of how to bring balance in one's life. What do you mean by the center column? The center is everything in moderation, except when it comes to humility. The center is the idea of balance. I'll give you an example. The center is knowledge. It's able to bring harmony between the intellect and the emotions. Emotionally, one can become very passionate about their religion or about God. About God. And it could lead them to a point where they can go off the deep end. The intellectualism brings them back. That kind of balance is what we're looking for. Actually, the center column touches the infinite more than the right or the left because that's the reason that it has the ability to fuse the two together because it stands higher than the two. Rabbi, is it only humanity that is in the image of God? Yes. It says so clearly that it was the human that was created in the image of God. It does not mean that animals don't have a divine kind of soul, but it's not at the level of a human being. The human was considered to be the choice creation because the human was given the intelligence, the creativity, and with that, the responsibility to make the world a garden of the light for God, a spiritual place. In order to achieve that, the human was created in the image of God. Rabbi, how does the mind help us reach the heart? I will answer it in a little bit of a humorous way and not to offend any age group. If you ever have a conversation with a teenager, in the world of a teenager, feelings substitute ideas. If I feel that I like this, then it makes sense to me. The mind is the only way to reach the heart. The Zohar, which is the primary book of Kabbalah, says that by nature God created us that the mind should dominate over the heart. Dominate over the heart doesn't mean to suppress the heart, but actually to develop the heart. If we have emotional feelings that come forth, but they are not cultivated and they're not tamed and they're not uh, harnessed and directed, they can go all over the place. It could become very animalistic. The true idea of a feeling is when there is thought and intellectualism that actually creates it. In the vernacular of Kabbalah, the intellect are the parents 
of the emotional feelings which are their children. Even though the source of emotions are much deeper than the intellect, but it's, con it's considered as if they have given birth to it. So if you want to develop a feeling for something, you want to study about it, examine it, understand it. And the more you bond with it intellectually, the more it begins to resonate in your heart. And then the feelings that you develop as a result of that are very healthy feelings. Can one have a relationship with God without studying the Torah? They can, but it is considered to be an immature kind of relationship. With the Rebbe no longer here in physical form, how is it that the Chabad movement is administered? And from whom do you get ultimate guidance? So the Rebbe began to decentralize the Chabad movement just before he passed away. And he did establish some governing bodies within Chabad. And they're made up of representatives from around the world that meet regularly and help guide with the policy of Chabad. But the Rebbe himself has left thousands upon thousands of writings. One has to remember that the Rebbe had very little time for himself. He would sleep literally about an hour and a half or two hours a night. And he published a tremendous amount, and he spoke a tremendous amount, and he guided and met with people that they're still deciphering through all of his writings that has left us with a tremendous amount of instruction. And there are rabbinical bodies within Chabad that deal with issues, and of course there are questions that come up, and there are doubts, so sometimes there can even be disputes of what's the right way, and the Rebbe had put into place a system of how they should be uh, handled with. What doesn't happen today is initiating new campaigns and new ideas that the Rebbe did. But I would say in all honesty that what the Rebbe did in his lifetime is still so vast that it's taking us time to catch up. Rabbi, you grew up in Brooklyn, New York. What do you remember about your childhood? Well, I grew up in, a, in, in Brooklyn, New York, which was a melting pot of uh, many Jews that came from Eastern Europe and Western Europe. It was a post-Holocaust area, so we grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust and the shadow of Stalin. My grandfather, for instance, served four years in Siberia for the crime of tutoring a bar mitzvah boy for his bar mitzvah. His father, my great-grandfather, was burnt alive by the Nazis. So these were things that were very, very much upon our mind. But on the other hand, it was a very loving neighborhood, and of course, growing up in Brooklyn, in the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, where the Rebbe lived, uh, the presence of the Rebbe was something that really was the light of our life. And just to be able to pray in his synagogue and listen to his addresses. In fact, it's interesting that you asked the question, because the younger generation in Chabad itself is so eager today to learn about the unwritten history because they've studied everything that's written. So those that have grown up in the 60s and the 70s are asked constantly to share our memories of what it was, but it was fascinating. It was actually almost like living in a spiritual paradise, even though most of the people weren't wealthy and some even were below the poverty line, but there was a sense of happiness and meaning and fulfillment in life. Your father was secretary to the Rebbe. What did that mean for your family? On a practical level, we saw very little of him because he worked uh, the Rebbe's hours, uh, which would finish about one o'clock in the morning. On the other hand, it was a great pride to us, but also it carried a big burden and responsibility because our behavior would reflect the kind of teaching and education that he would educate us with. So... We felt that it wasn't a badge of honor that we walked around with or felt, look who we are, that our dad is the one. One of the, the Rebbe had several secretaries, but one of the Rebbe's secretaries, actually, it was a little burdensome to know that if we act out of line, it could reflect on him. But it was a tremendous merit for us. I remember my dad putting in a tremendous amount of hours, and one o'clock in the morning, he would come home and then he would sit for an hour or two and write notes, uh, scholarly notes on Hasidic works that the Rebbe asked him to do, that they were published after that. So that was very important. 
Tell me about your mom, your mother. My mom is a very dynamic woman. What I was impressed uh, with my mother is that her education was actually being a refugee, escaping the Soviet Union, living in Europe until she came to the United States, and everything that she knows was self-taught. I remember when we were in elementary school, she was taking night courses to catch up in her education and to be qualified as a teacher. And she still teaches, and she loves it. So she just loves Jewish learning. It's interesting that she will also ask me for recordings of my classes with the Jewish Learning Institute, and she listens to them, and then she comments on that. And, and she's always meeting with people, the younger generation, especially um, college graduates, and studying text and, and learning it. And she was very active. She is still active. Was, in her youth, she was much more active in the community. How do you think you are like your father, and how do you think you are like your mother? My mannerism is more like my father, and probably that's a trait that everybody in, inherits. My mother is an adventurous type. She never wants to sit still. She wouldn't be happy to be confined in one place. And if she has the option, she would travel and explore. And I think that's something that I inherited from her. What was expected of you growing up? To be a good student, to be able to produce and to fulfill what was demanded from every Chabad young person. Nothing more than anyone else, and nothing less. Mm -hmm. What is expected of every Chabad young person? To live life to its fullest meaning, to see the meaning in every living being, and to choose a life that would be most productive in helping other people. Some people do it through the rabbinate, some people do it through business, uh, some people do it through starting organizations like my Son is involved in an organization called Friendship Circle that helps children with special needs, and they have this uh, Zapp's Place, a superior uh, boutique, thrift boutique in Matthews, and they really care about people that are on the, I should say, on the spectrum that people don't pay attention to. Um, you do the best you can do with your talents. That's what's expected of you, but to use it in the right way. Did you always embrace this expectation, or was there ever a moment where... You resisted it? No, never, never resisted it. I was always very happy with it. It was a goal in life. I don't know if I'm actually fulfilling it to the fullest. That's the challenge. We can all do better, but it was never, there was never a doubt in my mind that this is what I wanted to pursue. When did you know that you wanted to pursue the rabbinate? Uh, when I was a teenager, and I was studying in yeshiva and Talmudical schools, Talmudical academy, I have a love and a passion for study. And to me, being a rabbi, the most enjoyable part is to be able to teach and to share the ideas and inspire people. When I get feedback that someone says, you have inspired me, I have made this change in my life because of what you said or what you have done, to me, that's the most rewarding. Rabbi, you did attend yeshiva in New York and overseas as well. What do you remember about those days? They were free of burden. Uh, they were happy days. The burden was studying, but it didn't have the kind of burden that I have now dealing with a community and dealing with the organizations that I need to deal with. So I have very fond memories. I would say, in a sense, it was the richest time of my life, being able to delve into study, being in the presence of the Rebbe, and having the camaraderie that I had. It's, it was glorious years. And whether it was in New York or France or Israel, I gained a tremendous amount of going outside of my birthplace and seeing how others live and how others practice and how others perceive things. And it added a lot to, to my own experience, and it made me better in what I do. But I have very fond memories of my school years. It wasn't a burden. On the contrary, it was a delight. Rabbi, how did you find your way to Charlotte? That's an interesting question. Chabad had, uh, has a summer program where rabbinical students go out to communities to visit Jewish people in outlying communities and to share Jewish precepts, Jewish concepts, and, and help them establish a Jewish library and a Jewish life. 
In the 70s, Chabad did not have as many centers as we have today. It was in the mid-70s, I had just come back from Israel, and a friend of mine said, I'm looking for a partner to go down to the Carolinas with me. And I said, okay. And honestly, my only connection to the Carolinas was that a neighbor of ours on our street had a sister that lived here in Charlotte. She still lives here in Charlotte. Uh, but I didn't know much more about it. And after my rabbinic partner went off to Illinois, I was sort of told, continue on. And I began to build relationships and connections here over the years. And after I got married and I finished post-rabbinic school, the Chabad organization came and said, since you have a connection to the Carolinas, and we would like to open a Chabad center in the Carolinas, and they think Charlotte is the center of both Carolinas, uh, we would like to offer it to you. It didn't come from the Rebbe. It came from the hierarchy. And then after I said yes, I wrote to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe accepted it under certain conditions of what we had to do and what we needed to do. And then I was given the position of being the first Chabad emissary in the Carolinas, and it became my duty to open up Chabad centers in other cities in the Carolinas both in North Carolina and South Carolina. You know, there's something about living in a smaller town, a smaller Jewish population area, where people look for ways how to identify themselves as Jewish and cherish it more. They don't take it for granted. New York has the largest Jewish community in the United States. For a time, it had the largest Jewish community in the world. I think Israel today exceeds the population of the New York metro area. So you took it for granted that a lot of people that you meet are Jewish and know about Judaism. Coming down to North Carolina in 1980, a lot of facts and concepts of Judaism were not known by the population. And the Jewish community in general is a very warm, Southern hospitality, a very warm, receptive community. So it was very rewarding. Rabbi, you lead the Charlotte Jewish Learning Institute. What is the work that you do there? The Jewish Learning Institute is part of the International JLI, and it develops courses on Jewish ethics, on Jewish law, on Jewish philosophy, and Jewish history, college level. And it gives the opportunity to anyone in the community, Jewish or not, to come and take a six-week course and study the meaning and the precepts of Judaism in depth. We have found that the people that take the JLI become immersed in it, and it actually opens up new vistas for them. As an instructor, I can say that it opens up new vistas for myself as well. It's treated on a very high intellectual level, but yet it is distilled in a way that every layperson can actually benefit from it. Which is going to give you some samples. We did a Holocaust course as well, and it was called The Soul of the Holocaust. It wasn't a course on the history of the Holocaust. It was a question of how did people maintain their spirituality at the time of the Holocaust. It was actually based on stories and responsa that people wrote in the most horrific situations. We do medical ethics. We have JLI courses on on questions like euthanasia, and the questions of abortion, questions on preventative surgery, if there's a doubt, all kinds of things, and then ethics in general. And a lot of our courses are actually certified by the North Carolina State Bar so that lawyers and in some cases physicians can get their continued legal education or continued medical education credits by taking this course. The State Bar or the Medical Bar actually reviews the course and then they assign a certain amount of credit. So we've had a phenomenal success with it. Rabbi, what connection do you see between ethics and mysticism? There is a very deep connection uh, between mysticism and ethics. First of all, ethics is a litmus test whether the mysticism that you're studying is truly capturing you and changing you. Uh, One of the goals of mysticism is to make the person more humble and more sensitive of the needs of others. If someone is using mysticism just to ingratiate themselves or to grow on their own and seclude themselves from the rest of the world, 
That's not what mysticism is about. So there's a direct correlation right there. But if you look at mysticism, where mysticism sees the emotional aspect and behavioral aspect as a direct corollary to the intellectual, it all has to be harmonized. It has to be one body. Ethics actually says more about the person than anyone else. And I'll share a little story with you. This is from the Talmud. There were two great sages in the days of the Talmud. One was Shammai and the other one was Hillel. We always learn about the house of Shammai arguing with the house of Hillel. And the story is that there was a non-Jewish person who had visited Israel and went to Shammai and said, teach me the entire Torah while I stand on one foot. Shammai was very strict and he said, that's making a mockery of Torah. Well, he went to Hillel and Hillel received him warmly. And Hillel said, this that is spiteful to you, do not do to your friend. That is the essence. The rest is commentary. Now go study. The question is, why would that become the foundation of Torah? Torah teaches us how to have a relationship with God. It also teaches us how to have a relationship with other human beings. And the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi, in his monumental book called the Tanya, explains that since the ultimate goal of mysticism is to spiritualize you and sensitize you and feel humble in the eyes of God and to allow the soul to dominate over the body, if it's not expressed in how you feel towards someone else, then you're not accomplishing, you don't get it. And that's what Hill was trying to say. If you want to reach the highest zenith, the epitome of Torah, which is the mystical aspect of Torah, it'll be expressed in how you feel towards someone else. So that's why there's a very strong connection between the two. Rabbi, I'd like to conclude on this last question. What does God want for us? God wants us to be his partners. God doesn't need us. God is the all supreme being. God can't even be defined as infinite because infinity itself is already a definition. And God in his wisdom decided that he wants to create a world. And in this world, he'll put all kinds of species, all kinds of creatures. And in it is, he inserted the people as well. And he's given the people, the brains, the ability. And he says, now I want you to partner with me. I have created a raw world, and I want you to be the one to bring spirituality and godliness into this world. And every human being plays a role in this mission. The Rebbe once said, when a child is born, that is a statement from God that from this moment and on, the world can't be perfect without this human being, without this child. And therefore, everybody has a potential. God doesn't need us. We don't know why he has chosen this path, but we do know that he has. And he wants each and every one of us to be a partner in his big scheme. And he's longingly looking at us with love and saying, please be my partners. Thank you for your time today, Rabbi. It's a pleasure. Yossi Groner is Senior Rabbi and Spiritual Leader of Congregation Or HaTorah, a Jewish Orthodox congregation. He was ordained with his rabbinic degree in Talmudic studies at the Central Lubavitch Yeshiva in New York City. And now, a personal word. I may have a Jewish spark within me. I might make a fine convert to Judaism, as I may already have the heart of a convert. There is nothing more than I love than the study of history, law, ethics, and theology. That has been my path. My father was Jewish. My mother is Catholic. I was taught by Marianist brothers and priests in high school. I was a history major and philosophy of religion minor in college. I studied law, and now I teach ethics and moral philosophy. I'm curious about the internal logic of ideas. What do followers believe? What is commandment? What is commentary? What is objective? What is subjective? How do ideas play out and give way to new paradigms? I'm interested in the Jewish view of the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic Age. 
I would like to learn more about how Orthodox Jews await his arrival with full faith every day, about how conservative Jews accept the Messianic era as literal truth and as metaphor, about how Reformed Jews reject a Redeemer yet work for an age of redemption. Rabbi Groner said that moments can become movements and consensus can form quickly about a Jewish prophesied Messiah in our midst. He says events will tell us that the Messianic age is upon us. Christians believe that moment already happened and that moment became a movement. What do Jews believe about Jesus? That he was not the Messiah. Jews believe the coming of the Messiah is associated with events that have not yet occurred, including the rebuilding of the temple and a messianic age of peace. And any claims about the divinity of Jesus is incompatible with the Jewish view of the absolute oneness and unity of God. Judaism teaches that it is heresy for any person to claim to be God, or part of God, or the Son of God. The Talmud states explicitly, if a man claims to be God, he is a liar. Nonetheless, the elders of Israel considered Jesus. They were aware of reports of his miracles. They heard claims that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They heard him preach that the kingdom of God was at hand. Before long, Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, the supreme Jewish legislative and judicial court. The Sanhedrin was composed of high priests, elders, and scribes. One of the responsibilities of the Sanhedrin was identification and confirmation of the Messiah. They spent much of their time identifying and denouncing false prophets. Annas and Caiaphas, high priests of the Sanhedrin, suspicious and wary of Jesus, and likely their minds already made up, interrogated Jesus, asking him if he was the Son of God. In one version, Jesus gave no definitive answer. If he said yes, then his answer would be blasphemous. If he said no, then his answer would be perjury, if in fact he believed himself the Messiah. Jesus responded, you say that I am. In another version, Jesus answered definitively that he was the Son of God and would soon be seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. The Sanhedrin condemned him, delivering him to Pontius Pilate, Roman Prefect of Judea, and the rest we know. Most Jews don't give Jesus much thought at all, other than being well aware of the centuries of Christian persecution in his name. What do Christians believe about Jesus? That he was the Messiah. Christians believe scriptural requirements concerning Jesus have been met. The historical Jesus was a Jew from Galilee who debated fellow Jews about how to follow God, engaged in healings, taught in parables, and gathered followers. He was executed. His followers believe that his crucifixion atones for the sins of humanity, that he was resurrected and ascended to heaven, and that one day he will judge the living and the dead. Christians worship Jesus as the incarnation of God and the second of three divine persons of a trinity. That's a pretty big theological divide between Christians and Jews. I like listening to Rabbi Groner. I have so many questions for him. I like listening to Catholic priests and Protestant ministers too. I have even more questions for them. I listen to their answers and then I arrive at my own. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform 
that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.